my pleasure to introduce Peter Weissman. Peter is an alum. He's one of the founders of the George Washington uh, Entrepreneurs Roundtable. He's a longtime uh, supporter and benefactor of the uh, New Venture Competition. In fact, uh, Peter and his firm sponsor the, the prize for the best undergraduate uh, team in, in the competition. Uh, Peter is, Peter's expertise is intellectual property. Is that, uh, that mm -hmm. fair? He works in uh, Blank Rome, just uh, down in the Watergate. Did you walk here? In yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you'll, you'll fill in the pieces that I haven't, but Peter has been a, been a great source of, uh, of expertise to uh, aspiring entrepreneurs at GW uh, who have issues with intellectual property and, and other, other legal matters. So it's, uh, we're very, much, very lucky to have him and to have him here tonight. So with that, uh, Peter, take it away. All right. So uh, I'll also mention that this year the firm is giving an in-kind uh, award for the <laughs> venture competition. Uh, so it's going to be pretty substantial. Um, it'll be great value for whoever wins. I don't know how we're splitting it up yet. Well, we said three or more teams. Yeah. Trying to spread it around a little bit. It's fifteen thousand dollars. Right, fifteen thousand total. So uh, we'll see how how that gets split up. But that could <clears throat> do a lot of. Uh, aid to somebody who wins a competition. So um, that's really something that's, that's kind of valuable because every startup has legal needs and no startup has the money to pay for it. So, um, so I, I really look forward to being able to work with the winning teams on any, any issues they may have. So I'll just give another word about myself. Um, should we leave this door open? Is that, uh, that's fine with me. If, they'll be coming in. Okay. The late arriving crowd. So, um, my name is Peter Weissman again. I'm a partner at the law firm of Blank Room. We have over 600 attorneys now. Uh, I believe we're, th I like to say we're throughout the world. We have one office in Beijing as well as in D.C., New York, uh, Delaware, Los Angeles, and a couple of other locations, Philadelphia. And we uh, full service pretty much. We practice in all areas of the law, but I myself, I specialize in intellectual property, which breaks down into patents, trademarks, copyrights, uh, I do a lot of licensing work, so I'm familiar with contracts and stuff like that, uh, non-disclosure agreements and, and things like that as well. <clears throat> but I also work with a lot of companies, both big and, and startup companies as well. So I have a lot of uh, experience with what company needs uh, exist and how to help them solve problems as well as making contacts uh, for them or with them. Uh, with, with perhaps some of our other clients. So, um, so feel free to touch base with me about any question you may have. If I don't know an answer today, there is lo there's almost certainly someone at my law firm who does know. So to the extent I don't answer a question or if you have other questions that arise after this, feel free to give me a ring. My phone number is here as well as uh, I'm sure it's online and uh, have some cards if anyone wants to take a card with them. So today I'm going to be speaking, uh, I'll, I'll speak mostly about intellectual property, but before we do that, I'll just speak briefly about companies and corporations and, and forming them and the importance to any new startup company. So <clears throat> a few of the legal pitfalls that I've just seen over the years, and I'll kind of go through them, um, just things that I've seen people coming to me saying I have problems and, and the like, and I kind of try to keep track of some of them. So budgeting for legal expense, of course, as I mentioned, startups have a lot of constraints on them, a lot of financial constraints, and they don't always have a, a lot of financial assets. So that is something that even as you're preparing your business plan, you should try to budget for, and almost every company is going to need some sort of legal expense. Depends on the type of company you are and what type of issues you may face, uh, but, but you should try to assess what kind of legal issues you might have and try to allocate a budget for that. Uh, some things that people don't always think about is if you're exporting product or importing product, you may have some sort of regulations that you need to comply with. If you're a telecommunications company, you may have uh, FCC regulations and the like. So those are things that people sometimes don't think about. Uh, recognizing your strengths and weaknesses. I, I do like to talk about this. I don't know how this goes over. Uh, you know. People feel free to give me, send me an email with some feedback. I'd love to hear it. But, but sometimes I feel like 
the, the people are out there and there's always a few people who are very good at, I'll call it marketing or sales, and they're really their personalities, and I'll, I'll say the stereotypical uh, car salesman or car salesperson where the, you, know, you could sell somebody the Brooklyn Bridge. And you may sit next to that person, and I remember there was someone in law school who was like this. You know, he's very smooth on his, on his feet and he could, could speak very well. Uh, the, not everybody has to be the, the car salesperson in order to be successful as a, in business and even with your own company. And, and the story I like to tell is about one of our clients. He, he used to work for a large company and one day he decided he was going to quit his job. He came up with his own product which he felt met a really niche area and he stuck with it. He, he put it out there and he started selling to companies. He had a mortgage his house, not once but twice. And he was not a car salesman at all. He was quite frankly the exact opposite of that. He was very, very quiet, very slow spoken. Um, you know, I, it was hard to read him. He, he wasn't trying to push things. But he did it. I mean, he, he succeeded. And today he has over 350 employees. And he believed in his product. It was a great product. And they, you know, they have a full range of products now. So I, I just want to encourage people who, who are questioning themselves, because I know everybody does, you know, am I the right person? Can I do my own business? And, and to me, the most, one of the most important factors is sticking to your business and, and persevering and working through problems and figuring things out. So I like to put down, recognize your strengths and weaknesses. There are people who come to me very successful with their business. They can't read a contract for their life. And it's, it's even difficult for me to explain to them what the contract means. Uh, and I have to put it in very simple terms. But they're, they'll be incredible at their job, whether it's technically incredible or you know, great business people. Uh, I have a guy who's an extremely brilliant uh, designer of um, technology, and I'm not going to tell you exactly which, but it, it's not brain surgery, but it's very, it's very complicated technology. And I was at his office, and he couldn't print out a document. So you know, recognize what your strengths are, and you want to partner with people who can complement you. So if you, if you realize that you are the marketing person or you are the salesperson, realize that you may be weak in other areas, technology or whatever it is, and form a team that really complements your business. So that, that's the greatest thing you can do, you know, is to realize what your weaknesses are. Obtain uh, insurance, you know, people, people realize that there are liabilities out there and even if you do form a company, uh, you want to make sure that you have insurance for the products you have and the like so that if your company does get sued, you'll, you'll be able to withstand the lawsuit. Your, your attorney is a business resource, so as I mentioned, we have uh, over 600 attorneys at my law firm, and those attorneys are just like me. I have a client, and I want you to succeed. I want your business to do well. So if you email me with a question, I may not know the answer, or if you email me the problem you're having, maybe you don't know, you know, where, where can I find some commercial real estate? Well, we have a lawyer who's been practicing real estate for 20 years. He knows the brokers in the area. So I send out an email and my 600 partners look at the email and they want to make a match. They want their client to fulfill your need or vice versa. So, um, so I, I like to call it kind of a LinkedIn on steroids, if you will, or LinkedIn supersize. You know, everybody talks about, well, I should look to see who my second and third contacts are on LinkedIn. Well, you know, to the extent, um, you know, to the extent I send an email out, and I get emails every day saying, "Is it? do we have anyone who could help in this area or something like that. I, I want to read that email. I want to find out, do I have a client who can satisfy that need? Now, you know, if you're looking for a great restaurant in Los Angeles, I'm not going to circulate that to 600 attorneys. But um, if you have a real need, sometimes a match can be made. Uh, some agreements. Uh, w one thing that I often see is, People don't have what we call a founder's agreement or a vesting agreement. Um, I'll, I'll probably talk on that a little bit later on in the slide, but I just put it down there. So inevitably, once a year or sometimes two or three times a year, someone will come to me and we do a lot of work with GW startups. <clears throat> and by work, I mean they come to ask me questions. We don't you know that um, 
they don't always engage us, but there's still the client attorney client privilege. Uh, but but inevitably, a few people a year, once or twice, you know, sometimes you know, not every year, maybe we skip a year, but um, people come to me and and say, you know, the day we started this company, it was great. Everybody was motivated. We we're going to make a billion dollars. It was going to be a piece of cake. And lo and behold, you know, all of a sudden people had finals or they had other obligations or they, they uh, graduated from school and now they've gone to get a job and they have other obligations that are taking their, their time away from the business and they're not participating in the, agree in the, in the business as much as, as we thought they would initially. So, uh, so it's important to have some sort of an understanding at the beginning as to how you're going to divide up equity. And I'll, uh, I have a slide on this later, but you know you can do something where some of the equity is deferred over a period of time, so that if somebody drops out after six months, their equity may have not vested yet, and uh, they won't own a third of your business and, and hold you ransom, basically, or, or slow down your progress. Online legal forums. I mean, everybody knows about the the legal Zoom or something where they see forms, or you can Google and find forms. Typically, I'll say non-disclosure agreements aren't terrible. You know, a lot of them are fairly standard. But the problem with agreements is that you don't know. My, I have a client who says, you don't know what you don't know, which when I first heard it, I was like, what does that mean? I mean, it kind of goes to the same thing I said before, is you don't know what your weaknesses are. So and the problem is you may look at an agreement and you really don't know. There could be something in there that doesn't belong. There could be something that doesn't belong that's in there. I don't know if I said that the same thing <laughs> different ways, but I think you know what I mean. So, um, you know, but I will say non-disclosure agreements do tend to be fairly standard. I don't often see an issue where uh, I see it a non-disclosure and it just looks horrible. Uh, but still, I'm, I'm always willing to, uh, to, to give a quick overview of something. Non-disclosures are fairly simple. They're usually a page or two long. So um, if, if you're just unclear about it or uncertain, feel free to send it to me and I'll give you my thoughts on it. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything bullet point by bullet point, although I have been so far, uh, but feel free to ask me questions about anything you see up there. Uh, indemnification clauses, this is a big, a big red, red flag. I mean, uh, oftentimes when you do an agreement with another company, so you, they want to allocate their risk, and sometimes they want to do business with you because they want to put the risk on you and say, okay, I'll do business with you. You can design my website or you can design this product, but if anybody sues us, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look to you for indemnification, meaning you're going to have to pay any legal fees that I have and you're going to have to pay any damages that are incurred. So you want to be careful about indemnification agreements. Uh, read them carefully, understand them and know what you're getting into. Sometimes it's not negotiable. I mean, it depends on the company. It depends on what value you're bringing. Uh, you know, as, as a company develops, you develop more and more value. So today, you know, let's assume that today you, you have a great idea. Well, you often hear entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs say, well, great ideas are, are a dime a dozen. And truly they are. I mean, unless you have a business or, or a team formed around that idea, it's not going anywhere and it doesn't have any value or has very little value. So, you know, as you build your company, you know, day one you have your great idea, day two you build your team and that adds a little value, day three you start marketing, you know, you start uh, assessing the, the market and how you're going to do things and, you know, that builds a little more value, then you go out and you actually start building the product, you do a prototype that builds more value, you might file for a patent. Um, you know, and then eventually, hopefully one day you generate some revenue and then you generate some profit. Uh, that whole continuum uh, builds, builds value in your company and you get more and more leverage. So on day one, you have very little leverage to deal with another a company. But by the time you're Facebook, you know, you have all the leverage in the world. So, so sometimes um, agreements aren't, are not. Uh, negotiable and uh, there are a lot of companies that we do business with that we realize <laughs> you know client comes to us and says I want to do a deal with the NFL to license their uh, their, their products their, their um, logos and, and we will know what you know what is negotiable and what is not negotiable typically negotiable with those contracts but again if you're Facebook then you know almost anything could be negotiable 
Yes. For identification clause, um, it says now when you have one. I mean, is there any kind of common language that would flag you to if you're looking at one, or is it as simple as your contract to say identification? Um, uh -huh. I mean, what's a good way to understand yes. if you're in one or not? So I'll repeat the question in case people didn't hear and for the the tape. <clears throat> so the question was, how do you know what is an indemnification clause in an agreement? Oftentimes. Well, indemnification may not be in capitals. I think the representations and warranties are typically all in caps. So those are, th are things that you should read closely. Indemnification will say, we'll, we'll use that term, indemnification. You hereby indemnify us, okay. or we hereby indemnify you. Oftentimes, contracts will have headers. Uh, so it'll say indemnification, and representation, representations, and warranties, but, but not always, and sometimes, you know, depends if who prepares them, um, sometimes they won't know to put in heading or the heading will be misleading. So I put down here, uh, you know, as your company grows, ha have a lawyer audit things. So I, I think that makes sense. I mean, once you start generating revenue, once you can st start paying for things or getting, uh, you know, legal representation, it does make sense to me to go back and say, hey, these are the contracts we have. Uh, can you tell me if I screwed something up? Sometimes you can correct them. As you go forward, you, you may be able to, to supplement an agreement or the like. You know, have your corporate books looked at. Did we form the company properly? Is the operating agreement okay? Et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, after a period of time, you may want to go back and revisit some of those issues. And usually, usually this happens when you have an investor that's lined up or interested in the company. And we go through a process called due diligence. <clears throat> and during that process, uh, am I speaking a little too fast? Okay. During that process, what happens is the uh, the investor says, "I'm going to I'm going to invest some money in the company, but I want to know certain things about the company. Are are the corporate books, you know, done properly? Uh, I want to see a copy of your patent application, and you you don't always want to give it to them right away, but you know." I want to see a cop copy of the patent application. Did you file a provisional or did you file a full application, which we'll talk about? And they really look at basically they're they're looking behind the the, um, the screen to see exactly what is the company made of. But oftentimes, one of the more important factors is who is the team and you know do you have revenue? But but the team is a very important thing for for some of the reasons I've discussed before. Uh, so I do have the vesting schedule here, which we were speaking about. So this just says, you know, that, okay, we're each going to get a third. The three of us will each get a third, but it's going to vest over a period of time so that if one of us drops out, like I said, you don't own a substantial amount of the company. The, reason, the main reason you want to form a company, and, and I think most people know this, is to, to insulate yourself from liability so that <clears throat> when you have the company set up, uh, whether it's an LLC or an S Corp or whatever it happens to be, it insulates you from personal liability so that they can't, they can't so that if you do get into a lawsuit or somebody comes after you for whatever or, or you, you're losing money and, you know, you have creditors, so that they can't go after your personal assets like your car or your personal computer or a house. So they can only go after the assets of the company. So that's the main reason to form some sort of a company. And it, it's a good idea to form a company as soon as you can, and, you know, mostly if you're going to be signing an agreement with, with another company or something, uh, it, it is a good idea to put, put that in the name of the company. Wait, is this true for cases of consulting firms? So the question was whether that was true for consulting companies as well. There are things like partnerships or something that you can form uh, that you want to try to, you know, do that. It, it, and it depends on the type of company. Law firms, for instance, do limited par partnerships. Um, so it just depends on the state and exactly what you're doing as to whether you can form a. Uh, another great reason to form a company is, like I said, if you're doing an agreement with another, with another company, you want to put it in the name of your, your business, uh, ABC Company, so that if there's ever a dispute or if somebody leaves the company, it's clear who owns that agreement, you know, who's that agreement with. If, if it's with, let's say you have two partners and, you, and the agreement's in the name of one of your partners and the partner leaves or, you know, something happens or they're no longer interested in the business, now the agreement's in the, that name, the name of that person. So you want to have all the assets 
in the name of the business. That way you can own all your tangible and intangible assets, patents, trademarks, etc., owned by the company. So that way if somebody leaves, it, it doesn't um, slow you down. And, and as well, in the, company, in the company documents, you can specify you know, how the company is owned and who owns what and what the responsibilities are and what uh, consideration has been given by each party, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so put everything in the name of the company. Uh, what the, the tit for tat, if you will, is that once you do form the company, make sure that you do everything under the name of the company. So if you go out and you buy a computer in the name of the company, make sure you use uh, assets that are the company assets. So you want to pay, you want to have a checking account in the name of the business, you want to make sure that you write the checks in the name of the business or a credit card. Now if, you, if you're out somewhere and you buy something, you can reimburse yourself. I mean, it may sound a little silly, but you know, uh, write yourself a check from the company and put it in your personal account. So y you just want to make sure that you're not commingling your assets with those of the company and try to follow those company uh, structures. So there are a couple of different uh, types of businesses. Uh, most people are familiar with uh, some of these, especially limited liability companies. And that's going to be really well suited for most of the, most startup companies. Uh, once, you, once you form a business, that doesn't mean it's, it's ironclad it's, or it's you know, in, ro uh, in stone. You can't always change it. And sometimes people say, well, sometimes an investor wants me to have a different company or people are telling me that uh, if I want to go to a venture capitalist, I have to be a C corp or an S corp. Well, sometimes, sometimes venture capitalists do like to have the companies in a certain form, uh, but an LLC is going to be the cheapest and easiest for you to set up, and if you ever do get an investor, if that's one of your goals, you can always transfer the assets to a different form of the company, you start a new form, and that's when you're going to have money to do it, right? If, if somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to invest $100,000 or $150,000 in your business, then oftentimes my, my law firm, for instance, will work with you on the realization that we won't get paid until the transaction goes through and you actually have the money to pay for it. So, um, so uh, I, I, if, if you have questions, sometimes people want to be nonprofits, of course, you want to start off as a nonprofit rather than as an LLC or an S, S Corp. Uh, if you have a charitable purpose, for instance, or if you want to have tax deductible uh, charitable status, that, that's a much different situation. Oftentimes an LLC will be appropriate for folks if, uh, if someone thinks that they might need a special form of a company, um, you know, I'm always happy to speak with them about that. I have some, these next few slides, uh, and the slides are available online, so if, if you need that, you can get it there. Um, I have a couple of features that differentiate some of these companies. Uh, so, you know, if, if you're thinking about what type of company you should have, uh, you may want to look at some of those, but um, again, feel free to give me a ring if, if you want to discuss that. Does anyone have any questions so far? Um, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, you know, they're always so. So corporations are created by states. So. The state, states are always creating different forms of entities, and they're always design, you know, changing, changing the rules. Um, so uh, uh, I would have to speak to one of my corporate folks about that, but um, the, it, there, it's, always, it's always changing. <laughs> yes? Um, I have a question back to LLC, sole, and then the general partnership. Would uh -huh. you automatically just have an LLC, for example, if you had three people? Um, like, would it ever be an option for you to have a sole proprietor? Well, soul, soul would just be for one person. Uh, LLC could be for multiple persons. And uh, again, it's going to depend on the type of business you are. I would expect that most, most of the people who are here are, you know, consulting might be a little bit different, but uh, if, if, it's, if you have a product, for instance, I think you would prefer to have a, an LLC.
to do your question. Where are the slides be online? Where are the slides online? On the New Venture website, newventures.gwu.edu. There's a, a tab for uh, support resources and I think it's video, videos and presentations. I think they posted already. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Uh, yes. Oh, great, great. Um, so a B Corporation is not something that you start out as, but you get certified as a B Corporation later in the game by, um, I don't know what now. Um, there's a community called B Corporation, and they rate you on a number of different factors if you're socially and environmentally conscious, and also if like the mission of your business is to have a social impact, then you can be rated as a B Corporation. But it comes later. Yeah, there are there are yeah um, there are some companies between nonprofit and pro and for profit that some states have come up with in order to uh, you know find find the mi middle ground between the two. Was there a question over here? No. Uh, so I'll turn to intellectual property, and as I mentioned before, these are. Uh, traditionally what is known as intellectual property and it could also include licensing but just as an overview patents protect the uh, functional aspects of things trademarks protect how consumers recognize your product or service uh, copyrights are the expression of a work typically they can be songs they could be a user manual anything that you put in writing uh, a book a picture and trade secrets is information that you feel that other people aren't going to learn readily by you operating your business and you want to just keep it, keep it uh, <coughs> private and hopefully that information won't get, won't get out. Trade secret information, as I'll, I'll talk about later, also includes things like your, who your customers are, your pricing information, and these are things that you, you, know, you may be giving to your partners, you may be giving to your employees, and you want to you do want to take steps to, to make sure that they're kept secret. So the biggest question with uh, patents is, uh, what can I patent? You know, somebody, says, somebody comes to me and they have an idea, and they say, can I patent this? And it really breaks down into a two-part question. The first part, is it patentable subject matter? That means, is it, is it something that the patent office would even consider as being patentable? And uh, up until about a year ago, I would say almost everything is patentable. There, there is a Supreme Court case that says everything under, the, everything under the sun is patentable. But about a year ago, uh, there was a Supreme Court case that came out which touched upon the patentability of software. And since then, there has been an issue as to w whether all types of software are patentable or not. The, what, what it lo looks like at this point um, is that software that is integrated with a tangible device such as a sensor or um, some sort of machine that's used to build something. If you have software that's used to control those things or inter inter integrate with those things, then that seems to be what is most patentable. Um, you know, if it's built into a camera or something like that. The area that we, we seem to be having trouble with are things that are strictly online, so a website, something that's implemented by a computer and the computer is not, doesn't really receive data from other things other than other, other computers. So um, we're, we're seeing a lot of problems with the Patent Office rejecting those things. And uh, the, the one caveat I have here is that in America, once the Supreme Court makes a decision, it takes, uh, you know, what, 10 years before we figure out what it means. So the law is still somewhat in flux. There has been some guidance, but as other cases come out and other decisions are rendered, um, you know, who, who knows if Congress will ever act on these things. The, the law could change. So, um, so if, if, if you have something that's important to your business, even if it's software, you may want to consider getting a patent. Uh, I do like to point out ornamental design, which is the last thing on, on the list there. People often forget that you know even if their product has been done before, maybe it looks different. Sneakers, uh, there are a lot of companies who have, have a lot of design patents on sneakers, things like that. Uh, think about whether my design is unique enough that maybe it will qualify for design protection. 
uh, you can also get patents on you know, methods, methods of making something, method of manufacture, etc. So that was the first part of the test. One is, is it patentable subject matter? And uh, you know, with that one software caveat, you know, the answer is almost always going to be yes. The second part, is it patentable over what others have done before? And the answer I like to give is, you know, people always, oh, you know, is it patentable? There's this prior art and that prior art, and this, uh, you know, what, what should I do? Well, I tell them the cost of the patent application is going to probably be at least ten thousand dollars, depending on what the invention is. Simpler ones could be less. You know, more complicated ones certainly can be more. So that's the test, right? <laughs> that's the test. Ten thousand dollars is it worth it to my business? Is this is this innovation giving me enough value to recover that ten thousand dollars? If I spend ten thousand dollars, is an investor going to think the value of my company is now fifty thousand dollars higher? Maybe it is. You know, and uh, this I, I like to say when when you go to an investor, that that's all the, also the test. If you if you think that you're going to need an, an investor at one point, and and perhaps a serious investor like a venture capitalist, and you go to this person, and what are you going to tell that person? You're going to say, Hey, I got a great idea. This is a terrific business. Nobody's done this before. I can do it faster, cheaper, better, quicker, inside out, upside down. And they say, oh, this is terrific. I love your idea. How are we going to keep the, your competitors out? Where's your patent? What are you going to say, right? I mean, that's the value. Is that, is that worth $10,000 or not? I mean, maybe it isn't. Maybe it is. Um, and we'll talk about cheaper ways to follow as well. But, you know, what is the value to you? Is, do you think that your difference between what others have done is, is giving you commercial value? I mean, s there may be things about your uh, improvement that, are small improvements, and you would say, well, it's not really worth the money. But there may be larger core improvements that you've made uh, that, that gives you a lot of value. Uh, I don't know if there's anything on here as anyone wants me to talk about. Uh, I will just say that a patent doesn't give you the right to make anything. It just gives you the right to exclude others. So just because you invent uh, you know, a product, you still may have to comply with FCC regulations or whatever it is. And there may be somebody out there who has a, more, a broader patent or a more basic patent on a basic technology than you do, and you may have to deal with them or you, know, you, you don't always want to approach somebody. but. You may have to budget for that, or you may want to think about you know, strategy in order to deal with that person. So, so just to give you a simple example, uh, which my boss likes to talk about, let's go back to the cave times. And uh, let me see how I'm doing on time here. Uh, let's say you're a cave person, and uh, you know, your cave is a mile from the river. And every day, you're going down to the river to wash your clothes, or whatever you're doing, you drink, get a drink of water. And one day, you say, well, I'm going to slot, you know, I'm going to put these pieces of board together and come up with some sort of a bucket. So you go down to the, to the river and you, you, know, you fill your bucket of water and you bring it home and now you can use it all the time and all day long you don't have to go down four or five times a day. And it's great. You go to the cave person patent office and you get your patent. Now, you, now you're the patent owner on this bucket. Well, you know, um, your neighbor there sees this great bucket and says, wow, that, that's great, but it really looks awkward. You, you have to carry it like this and, and it's heavy. Uh, I'm going to put a piece of leather over the top, and I'm going to create a handle for your bucket. That way, you can carry two buckets, and, and it's not as cumbersome to, to carry. And that person, your neighbor, goes down to the patent office, and what does he or she do? They get their patent on the, bu on, the, on the handle for the bucket. So now there are two patents out there. You have the first patent on the bucket, second patent on the handle with the bucket. Well, neither of them can use each other's technologies because they, they each have a patent. So the guy with the handle can't make his bucket, right? So, and this is actually a very difficult concept for people. There is, you know, somebody comes to me and says, well, I, yeah, I, got, I got a patent with a handle on it uh, on my bucket. Why can't, I, th that means I can make it. it. No, you can't. You have to worry about the guy who has the patent on the bucket. At the same time, he, the, the guy with the bucket can make his bucket because he has a patent on it, but he can't put a handle on it. <laughs> So, you know, you may want to set up some sort of cross-licensing opportunity, whatever it is there. But, but that just illustrates the difference between patents. And, you know, putting a handle on a bucket, that's an improvement, right? So 
it's uh, part two of our test is, is it patentable over what others have done before? And it's just, you know, what, it, what have people done before? The improvement doesn't always have to make yours better. Uh, sometimes it won't make it better. It may, just may make it different. So let's say somebody gets a patent on the handle that's a leather strap. Somebody else puts two handles on the side. Is that a patentable difference? Yeah, it is. So um, is it better? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's better for certain applications, but worse for others. So you know, that's, that's a different. The, the third person could then get a patent, potentially, on uh, the bucket having two handles instead of one strap. And it, it may sound silly, but when I was at the patent office, I, I worked there for a couple of years <coughs> when I was um, younger. And uh, I, there, I had a friend who was an examiner in the handle art unit. So that is all she did, handles. Uh, it was on a pan, it was on a cup, it was on whatever the handle was on. She was, she was the woman for the job. So you know, she, every, all the handles throughout the country come to her. And actually, there may be two people. I, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, so the examiners are very, very um, focused on specific technologies. So uh, some other disadvantages, of course, is substantial time and effort. Um, it's not only the cost, but a substantial investment of time. And, and I encounter this at all levels, even big companies. Uh, their engineers come to me with a patent, and I need 40, 50 hours of their time to, to prepare this application. They have to tell me what the invention is. So it's not only a substantial amount of my time, but a substantial amount of your time or, or your team's time. Territorial, so patents, uh, you know, you file a patent application in, in the United States. It only protects you in the United States. So if somebody, somebody makes something in China and sells it in Europe, your U.S. patent doesn't help you. It gets expensive very quickly. Uh, to start filing in multiple areas. And the truth is, um, in investors really tend to not care outside the U.S. It depends on where your investor is, of course. We have a situation where the investor is in, uh, in an Arabian country and they want to, you know, they want to get patents in those countries. Or if you know of a specific competitor that is in a country, or uh, manufacturing capabilities, you may want to go into those countries for those reasons. Yes, go ahead. Uh -huh. Like for uh, like company like Honda, uh -huh. how do they uh, solve the patent problems? Uh, because uh, they manufacture like they have they compound they are manufacturing units in Mexico, or some are in the state of Pennsylvania, some in Germany. Uh, and, and again, the finished product is coming from Japan. So how, how do they solve that issue of patents? Yeah, so the question is, how do, how do companies determine where they should file patent applications? And mostly, it can be where your employees are located, but oftentimes it's a consideration of where are your competitors? Uh, are they manufacturing it in China? You may want to have a patent there. Or are they mostly targeting for sales in Taiwan? Uh, it just depends on what your business is, where your competitors are, and where your customers are. If you have a lot of customers in a certain country, you may want to file a patent application there. Any other questions? Yes? Does the patent office give any consideration to uh, regulatory statutes in other departments? So so the question is whether the Patent Office looks at uh, other regulations, government re regulations. And the answer is that the Patent Office doesn't want to issue a patent for something that will embarrass them. Uh, so a perpetual machine, you know, if you say, and I, I get this, I've probably had three or four people come to me with machines that basically would last forever, you know, and never need to be refueled or whatever it is. So perpetual machines, the patent office is always watching for something like that or something that just doesn't work. I had an application once and uh, there was a cover somewhere. This was when I was at the patent office. There was a cover that blocked operation thing. And I, I gave him a rejection. I said, it just doesn't work. And he had problem dealing with that. 
Um, but it, no, I mean, if if the FCC says you can only operate on these frequencies, I don't think the patent office really cares whether yours is operating outside those frequencies. But you may not be able to use it. Um, and who knows? Maybe the FCC one day will change what frequencies it allows you to operate on. So the short answer is no. Um, used to be that you couldn't uh, get a patent on um, you know, bongs and stuff like that, but nowadays I, I think the, the door is kind of open more up for that. So there are two types of applications, um, provisional and non-provisional. And the difference is that a provisional is just a quick, short filing. If you go to LegalZoom, this is what you're going to be filing, a provisional application. There has been trouble with some marketing companies in the past uh, where they'll tell you, I'll get you a great patent for $1,000. And I, I don't know if they're using provisionals now, but they used to file a design application. And the design application should cost you know, $1,000 to $2,000. It's, it's not going to cost as much as utility because all the design is is a picture of uh, whatever the product is. So a provisional is, is a way that you can file something quick and uh, more cheaply. And we, we tend to do provisionals between $500 and $2,500. And the reason I give the $2,500 upper limit is because after that, we might as well just do a full application. And, it, and we can just um, devote how much time you want to spend to the application. If you think it's worth $1,000 or $1,500, we'll work until we get to that point. Um, and the way I like to do it is to just ask you questions to let you rewrite the document as opposed to me. We don't go into the nitty gritty. But, but the, the disadvantage with the provisional um, is that it's not a full application. I, I might not know everything that needs to be in there because I haven't had the time to invest in the, in the, in the provisional to really flesh everything out. So the, the danger is that we file the provisional and then six months later you start disclosing information that isn't in the provisional. Or a year, so a provisional only lasts for one year. Within that one year you have to file your full application. If, if at that time we're doing the full application and we discover, well, the provisional really doesn't have as much information as it needs to have, then the filing date of the provisional application may not um, be useful to you in the patent office. The patent office tr usually doesn't say the, you don't, you're not entitled to the filing date. It could come up in litigation later, but um, there could be a real issue with it. So our preference isn't to do a provisional, but oftentimes we file it because it, you know, it's not worth going forward with the full application. And we, we do that not only for startups, but some of our regular clients, our big clients. Our big clients don't file in every country. They don't file full applications on every idea, and they often will abandon them. So they may file a provisional, think it's, it's great, but they want that one year to kind of explore it a little bit, think about it, um, see what the market is, and determine whether it's worth going forward with the full application. <coughs> yes? So this bottom line, it will not benefit from the provisional if it doesn't disclose the endowment. So say you file a provisional and then you have the year to play with it and make it better, et cetera, and you change it so you add something or you take something out, it would count as something brand new, essentially? So let's say your provisional discloses A and B. Um, and then in six months you file, you, you come up with an improvement C. You can file another, a second provisional, there's nothing to stop you from doing that. But let's say you go the full year and at the one year you're pre preparing the full application and C is now really important, but C is not disclosed in the provisional application. And you want to claim C, meaning at the end of the patent you, you put in a set of claims saying, I claim my invention to be a bucket with a handle. Um, so uh, if you go to claim the handle and the handle isn't disclosed in the provisional application, then you're not entitled to the filing date of the provisional and it's almost like you didn't file it at all. So uh, what, one of the questions people ask me is, you know, hey, I'm an English major, I know how to write, um, I'll just, you know, what if, I, what if I write the application, I send it to you, you just spend half an hour on it and um, and, and it won't cost $10,000. That's really only happened for me once. And um, 
it, it doesn't mean that you don't, you know, that you're not a great writer and you don't know how to put together a sentence or a, a paragraph, but it's a you don't know what you don't know issue. And I can tell you right now what you're going to do wrong with your patent application. It's not going to have enough detail. So it, uh, just as an example, uh, and I re should really think through these examples before I give them on the fly, but, but let's say you, you do want to write a patent application for a bucket with a handle. I mean, how are you going to write that? Well, you know, how are you going to describe the bucket? Well, it's a circular thing. It has a bottom, and you, put, you can put water in it. It holds the water. It's whatever. You need, you need more detail than that. You need to say it's a, it's a um, bucket. It has several parts to it. It has side walls, and it has a bottom. The side walls are formed by elongated uh, rectangular slats that are compressed together with a sealant between them. And, a, well, it's three parts, the, the side walls, the bottom, and the uh, metal bars that go around the outside. So, so you have to analyze each part. You know, you talk about, for, first, the first thing I like to do is I list the parts. What are the, what are the parts of this bucket? Um, the bottom, the side walls, the, uh, the, support arm, the support rings, and the handle. And then you go through each one and you start talking about each element. So you talk about you may want to talk about the bottom first. Well, the bottom is circular and uh, it's uh, you know may have a th certain thickness to it. It's made of a certain material, and then you move on to the next part. You move to the walls and you talk about them being independently, uh, you know, rectangular members with a you may want to say a rectangular cross section, et cetera, et cetera. So you drill down, and each part may have subparts to it. So um, it, it's not that you don't know uh, how how to describe something, but it's the experience of knowing at what level you need to describe it. Um, I've been supervising associate attorneys for, uh, you know, 15 years now, and it takes an attorney about, I would say, two or three years of writing, just writing applications before they get to the hang of what needs to be in there and what does not need to be in there. So for you to pick up a new, you know, an application, say, I'm going to write this application, is, is not recognizing your weaknesses. I mean, you need somebody to help you out. Now, the good news is that for GW and, you know, sometimes other people, um, if you want to put together your own provisional application and send me a draft, I'm happy to look at, look at it for you and tell you what I think is missing from there. And then you can, you know, think about whether you want to rewrite it or add some more discussion to it. So there's no, you know, no charge for that. Uh, you can just email it to me, and it, it doesn't take much of my time. And like I said, I, you know, I could tell you right now what you've done wrong. Um, software, you want to make sure if you have a software invention, you want to make sure you have a good hardware discussion in there, as well as figures of the hardware. You want to have flow diagrams in there, uh, screenshots if you have screenshots, et cetera. So uh, there are certain things that applications will have in there. Statutory bar. So, if there's one thing that you should take out of this today, it's this concept of statutory bar. It's a confusing term, and, and the reason we came up with that term is it allows us to bill you a lot more money by, by coming up with a fancy term that you don't understand. What that means is that, and, and you know, I, I, would, I would expect if you go to any kindergarten class and you, you know, you, you take a poll of the students there, and you say, um, I, I have a great idea, what should I do with it? What are they going to tell you to do, right? Go out and start marketing it? No, they're going to tell you, don't tell anybody. You know, every kid knows this. I have a great idea, don't tell anybody. Um, I've heard it personally from my own kids, you know, they, they have discussions in class and, you know, everyone talks to them about patents because they know who, who I am. And there was, don't tell anybody, right? Don't tell anybody. You, you learned about that. That's what that means, statutory bar. Don't tell anybody. Um, you want to file your patent application before you tell anybody. And the trick is that what does it mean to tell somebody? A disclosure to a, one person or a few people can be enough to trigger it, to, to trigger what we call the, uh, the, uh, the um, grace period. In the United States, the good news is that you get one year from when you tell somebody to file your patent application. But most other countries don't give you that one year grace period. 
So you want to file your application before you disclose it in order to preserve your rights throughout the world. Um, but you know, if you're sitting here and saying, well, I have already disclosed it, if it's been less than a year, you can still file in the U.S. and maybe that's all you care about. So, um, but the better, better practice is not to disclose it until you actually file an application first. And like I said, the trick in is knowing what does it mean to disclose it. And I put up here a couple of things. If you use it in a commercial sense, even if it's a secret use, that can be a, uh, a disclosure. Uh, let's see, I, thought, I think I have another. So uh, speaking, you can disclose it by speaking. You can disclose it by a written publication, if it's on your website or if you email a lot of people. If you have a dissertation in Gelman, is it? Oh, I forget now. Gelman Library? Yeah. Uh, and the only p way you can, f there's a case about this. And the only way you can find that dissertation is by going down to the card catalog and flipping through and looking in there. And that's the only way you can find it. That is a disclosure of your invention. Uh, if you file a, for grant applications, some grant applications are made publicly available by FOIA requests or something like that. That's considered a disclosure of your invention. Uh, now, it may not be, you know, all that problematic if the disclosure was just a short paragraph. Maybe that's, you know, not, not as bad. There are, there are thousands of cases on what, it, what constitutes a disclosure. Um, we had to do that because we can't charge you more money unless we have something really complicated. So there are thousands of cases about what is a disclosure, what kind of speaking engagement constitutes a disclosure of the invention. And uh, so speak with an attorney and, and they're going to tell you it may be, it may, be, may not be. Uh, the better thing to do is to file you know, within one year of that or before you do that. Yes? Can you disclose something? And it's to whom you disclosed it. They don't like contest it. Is it a problem? Like it was like two years ago, you mentioned the idea, you mentioned the process of the idea, but they don't have a problem with it. Is it still going to cause you a problem? Yeah. So, so this the question is whether somebody has to raise it uh, to the patent office or something like that. The patent office is really not going to know about your disclosures. The way it comes up is through litigation. You know, all of a sudden you're suing uh, a huge company. They're going to take depositions, your deposition, they're going to get your emails. If you've emailed somebody about it saying, oh, I'm so excited about this, and they're going to say, hey, who did you disclose it to, and, and why did you disclose it? If you disclosed it to your mom or your dad or a friend, that's probably not going to be a problem. Uh, if there's an expectation of confidentiality or if you have a confidentiality agreement, that might not be a problem. But if you start selling it to a bunch of customers, you know, saying, hey, I have this great idea, sign this confidentiality, it may not save you to have a, to the NDA. Just because you put the NDA in place doesn't mean that it's not still a disclosure uh, for, for purposes of the patent application. Now, you, you may still be okay, um, you know, and a lot of foreign countries aren't as concerned with that. So uh, the answer is, uh, you know, like I said before, the better thing to do is to count it as a disclosure and either file before that or within one year of that. So uh, the question is, what if you file after the year? Like I said, the patent office probably isn't going to find out unless it's on, on an archived website or something. You know, if it's a, if it's a printed publication, uh, it, it may be that the patent office would find it. Probably not, though. But anything that you disclose that's more than a year old is prior art even to you. So you may, you know, and it's common five years later to say, you know, I have an improvement to my, my original patent now. I put a bucket on the handle. And you can go back to the patent office and say, I want to patent the, the handle. If you go back within a year of when you first started selling the handle, I, I mean the original bucket, then that first patent is not prior art to you. But if you wait more than a year, then the fir your first patent is a prior art to you. So anything that's longer, any, anything that's under a year is not prior art to you. Anything that's more than a year is prior art to you. Yes. Uh, who enforces this abroad? Uh, who enforces what? Uh, you're talking about that there might not be any grace period. Oh, yeah. And so what's the enforcement like internationally? So the question is, uh, you know, how is this enforced in other countries? It's the same here. I mean, the patent offices probably aren't going to know that you made a disclosure before you filed your application. Uh, but 
Um, but if it goes into litigation, it could potentially come out. So if you go to enforce your patent against somebody, uh, you know, you're asking for a million dollars, they're going to darn well want to know, well, what were your disclosure activities? Um, no, well, yeah, I mean, it, so if you enforce your patent, you're going to be enforcing it in a court or a tribunal, mm -hmm. some, you know, whatever they call it in other countries. Um, so, country have a patent yeah, every country has a patent office. I'm sorry. Was that the? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lex. <laughs> uh, yeah, they all have uh, patent offices, uh, trademark offices. So, um, whenever we file in another country, we actually go to an attorney in that country. Uh, I, I have contacts throughout the world that if I want to file in Europe, I go to my contact in Europe and I say, please file this for us. Now, if you tell us of a disclosure, or if we know of a disclosure, and actually all inventors in the US have an obligation to tell the patent office about the prior art they're aware of. So if you have a disclosure that's more than a year old, uh, we would have an obligation to disclose that. And I've done that in the past, and sometimes you know, it depends what the disclosure is, if it's the complete invention or not. Uh, sometimes we've won, sometimes we've lost. Yes? Uh, I have a question about uh, for careers. Uh -huh. how, how does, if a new technology has to come out, how, how does companies uh, approach the investors for it? As foreclosure is a big part of it because you're raising capital for that particular project or technology. So you're asking how to. How, how does a company approach it as an investor to? generate money for that particular project? Um, I'm, I'm going to answer it, but I'm not sure I'm answering wh what you're asking. So I mean, so the patent application would be assigned to the company. So if you start a company, the, inve the inventors would assign all rights in that patent to the company. No, no, no investors. <coughs> like yeah. Outside, like suppose GE wants to take out a whole new technology into engines, in new technology, uh, potion systems. So how does GE approach approaches its investor, investors for generate capital for that because they, they have a portfolio because you just said they have to file the portfolio. Mm -hmm. They have to file the patent before they file the before they do anything. Right. Oh so are you asking um, if how how does company do capital raise for the yeah. absolutely new technology? So so a patent is an asset just like owning uh, anything else, whatever, whatever your assets are, if it's real estate, um, you know, machines, whatever it is. That's an asset. So the patent is assigned to the company. The company owns it like any other asset. And if they take a loan out, uh, the lending company can put a lien against the patent. So uh, as we mentioned before, when you do some, something like due diligence, if I want to sell my patent to a company, they're going to check the title on the on the patent, and it's a public record, uh, to see do I own the patent and does anyone have a lien against it. Peter, how much how much constitutes a disclosure? So if we take the, the bucket example, if I tell my caveman friends that I've got a great new way for getting water up to the cave, have I disclosed the bucket? Yeah, so that, no, I, I don't think that would be a disclosure. I mean, it's like saying I'm going to build a rocket to the moon and not, get, not having any details about it. Um, it has to be what's called an, ena an, an enabling disclosure. So it has to enable someone to actually make or use the product. Um, so if, if, a, uh, if the disclosure is rather vague, then it may not be a problem. This, this comes up in the context of the new venture competition all the time. Because mm -hmm. Folks have intellectual property and they want to talk to the judges, but they want to be careful not to disclose their technology. So it sounds like I well, talk about it in vague terms. Or right. Or right. In enabling terms. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, d you you don't want to make these decisions for yourself. Uh, you know, always consult with an attorney if you can, because it may not um, be as straightforward as an answer as as you think it might be. Was there another question? Yes. So. I'm not sure I'm following the problem with a disclosure. You mentioned that it might come out in litigation and uh, your patent might be void or something. Is that the only big problem? Or in litigation? I mean, uh, with uh, disclosing uh, before. So the question was, uh, you know, how are 
problems with disclosures, yeah. how do they arise? So maybe, excuse me, so we've done wide ranges of due diligence. A company, mm -hmm. we had a company buy a portfolio for $300 million. They could ask us, well, you know, it's a whole range of things. The, the least amount of effort we do is to check the title and make sure there's no liens and make sure it's owned by the company. But we can do a wide range of investigations, including asking the selling company, when was your first time that this was disclosed and tell us everything about that disclosure. And if there was a particularly important patent and there's an issue of, of the disclosure, you know, uh, is somebody going to pay a lot of money for that or not? Um, to tell you the truth, I mean, I'm a patent attorney, I shouldn't say this, but if you have revenue and value in your company, the patents are out the window. Um, it's nice to stop your competitors, but if you're the first to the market and you have something, you have customers, uh, isn't that what you care about, right? So it's nice to have patents. It's nice to say I can stop somebody. It's a tough game, and it is, it's an expensive game, um, and it doesn't always pay out. So, it, you know, patents are always an expense, and it's very rare that you're going to make money on your patent. Now, sometimes you, if you do have a great idea and it's, um, you know, it's something you can license to somebody or something like that. It, it has happened. I've, I had a little grandma in Nyack, New York, and she came to me. We got her patent, and she sold it for half a million dollars. So it worked for her. Um, and there are there are companies that would be interested in buying patents, um, but it but it's tough. It's not easy. Patent pitfalls, the biggest pitfall, even at our clients who we regularly file applications for, is not realizing that they have something that's patentable. And I will go to their office and I will walk around with them and I'll see, you know, this person's working on something and, you know, researchers love to talk about what they're working on and they don't realize that what they're working on can be patentable. So, you know, they're so tied up on it, they, they sometimes forget about it. So the improvement doesn't have to be a huge, vast improvement. It can be moving from a single leather strap to two metal, metal holders on the side of the, of the bucket. So don't rule out that it may be something that's patentable. And the question really is, commercially, is it worth it? Is it giving you enough value to, to pay for the, the application? Uh, inventors should all be within your company, so if you have somebody build a website for you, if you have somebody design a product for you, make sure that your agreement with them says who's going to own the patent, because if somebody else is an inventor that is not part of your company, and you have to list who the inventors are, uh, then, then that inventor is going to have an equal share of your patent application, and you, you don't want to deal with that, so make sure you any agreement that you have with somebody, you're paying them money, they should be assigning their rights to you. And it's simple to put that in writing and uh, you know you want to have that up front because that's when you're going to have the most leverage <clears throat> and uh, you know that way when, it, when you do file, if you do file for an application, it's clear that they're going to have to assign that to you. Uh, I'm going to skip over some of this. Again, uh, you know, the slides are available online. If, uh, if anyone you know, reads through it and they have any questions, feel free to ask me. And a lot of this information is contained in the handouts that I gave you. There are, there are actually two handouts, one that gives an overview of all the intellectual property and one that uh, gives more information about patent applications per se. If you don't have that, I don't know if we ran out or not, um, I think the handouts are available online as well. Everybody should have gotten one when they came in. Anybody not get a handout? Okay. The, get some more. Okay. Thank you, Lex. Uh, so we're going to turn to trademarks. Does anyone have any final questions on patents before we do that? Yes. Well, let's say you bought a provisional patent with uh, one attorney and then you want to follow a utility patent with another attorney. How do you go about doing that? It's not a problem. It's it's, yeah. You, there's a power of attorney that you just have signed and it's not an issue. Uh, so we'll talk about trademarks ne next. And um, uh, tra trademark basically is what we call a source identifier. 
And you know, it took us a lot of time to figure out what kind of a complicated terminology we can use to describe what a trademark is. So um, it's a source identifier. And if you think about it, it really makes sense. It identifies the source of the goods or the services. So uh, what I like to talk about is you know, we have people from all over the world here, all over the country. And no matter where you go, if you, if you travel from the East Coast to the West Coast or West Coast to the East Coast, uh, and, and you, you're hungry and you're driving along the road and you see a sign that says uh, it has a big golden arches, right? It has a big M. You know immediately. What do you know? You know what you're going to get when you walk into that establishment. You know that if you order a Big Mac, it's going to have certain things on it. It's going to taste a certain way. It's not going to be, a, you know, a, a half pound burger. It, it doesn't have to be the best burger. It doesn't have to be the worst burger. But you know what you're going to get. And, and if you think about how powerful of a message that is, that anywhere I go, y you know, you're driving on the road and you search for a, for a McDonald's or you search for, you know, a grocery store chain that you know, or, you know, you look for a Holiday Inn. I, you, you never met these people before in your life, the people running the Holiday Inn, but you know that when you go in there, what kind of service you're going to get and whether, you know, what the price point is going to be and whether it's worth it for you. Um, and, and the person next door may be selling hamburgers as well, and they may be better burgers, and they may be cheaper burgers, but you don't know them, right? You don't know them. They're strangers. But that trademark has identified for you what, what the source of these goods are, are and, and what, what the product is going to be and what it's going to taste like. And you need to do that for your products and services. You need to be telling your customers how can they reach you, how can they identify what your product is or what your service is. So I don't care what you're selling, whether it's a biological kit or um, you know, a, a, a widget or a can or a, a bottle of soda. You need to be identifying for your customers right away what it is and how, how can they ask for it. And that's called uh, building goodwill in your company or building goodwill in the product. And that's extremely important. In some companies, that's all they have. There are some sneaker companies, that's all they have is a trademark. Uh, they don't make the product, they just sell it. So <clears throat> you, want to, uh, you want to pay a lot of attention to this. You want to make sure that you get a strong trademark. You don't want something that's overly descriptive. If it's descriptive, the trademark office might not give you protection for it. You can't register the term chair if you're selling chairs. You, you could, you know, if you're selling toilet bowls, you can register the name chair, but um, although it's a place to sit, so I don't know. Uh, Again, I've got to think of these examples beforehand, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, you want to pick something that, that's not too descriptive if you mark, um, although that's, you know, these days sometimes you just put an E in front of it and it seems like you can, um, and that's a strong mark. Ultimately, you do want to do what's in the best interest of the company, regardless of anything else I say here. It doesn't, you know, it makes no sense to get a patent for, for a, a leather strap for your product if you know it's not going to sell. Nobody wants a leather strap. They want the two, the two things on the side. Well, what are you getting a patent on a leather strap for? It goes to, you know, is it worth your money to, to spend on this? Don't, as people often ask me, what can I get a patent for? That's what I'm going to make. That's the wrong question you're asking, right? You've got to do what people are going to buy. If they're not buying, for, buying it, then, then what are you doing it for? So, uh, you know, you always hear people talk about how important it is to remain flexible. Well, don't let these patents and trademarks uh, make the decisions for you. Sorry, I'm just watching the time. Uh, you know, do what's in the best interest of your company. People, people always tell me, well, I got to have a patent. No, you don't. If you, if you can go out there and start selling, that's what you need to do. Don't worry about the patent. Uh, so using the R in the circle is, I don't, I don't think this uh, works on the screen, but <coughs> using the R in circle is when you actually have it registered. And trademarks are important, especially if you're going outside the United States. And the reason is this. If, you, if, you, uh, if you're a company and you're selling in another country, and you have a distributor there, or you have a manufacturer there, and then all of a sudden you have a problem with this manufacturer <laughs> distributor, and you go your own ways, you want to make sure you own that trademark. And I've had this problem before, and I tell my clients, but you know, it's, not ex it's not cheap to file in every country, of course. But if you do have a country where you have a lot of customers, or, pro or especially if you have a distributor or, or uh, some sort of distribution market, 
You want to make sure you own your trademark because they will file for a trademark if you don't. And I've had it done before. I had a very entrepreneurial attorney in Turkey send me an email saying, somebody's trying to register this trademark. We noticed your client owns it in the United States. And I went to my client and he said, that son of a gun, they, they, they had just contacted some guy over there and they were you know, looking to do a deal with him and he ran out and registered to and put an application in for his trademark. So you want to be careful. Um, if, you, if you don't own that trademark and you dissolve your relationship with this other company or entity, you're going to have a big problem and it's going to be expensive. Did you guys do anything to help them? Yeah, yeah, we told them, yeah, we, we forced them to sign it to us. Yeah, our client went to him and said, what are you doing? You know, it was bad relations for that guy. Um, Chevy Nova, people know in Spanish, uh, means no go. So Chevy Nova was not a popular vehicle in a lot of Spanish speaking countries. Any smiles on that one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, trademarks, uh, the filing fee is about $225 to $325 for an attorney to do it. It's, it'll be less than $1,000, but it, uh, total, you have to pay for the number of classes you have. So if you file for t-shirts as well as for, uh, you know, automobile repair services, that's going to be two classes. So it goes, you know, so you're going to pay $225 for each class. But generally it's relatively cheap um, compared to patents at least. But it is something that uh, you know has some expenses associated with it. What do you mean by classes? Exactly? So classes are just uh, there's a there's a list a classification list at the trademark office, and they'll tell you you know a mug if you're selling mugs, and a trademark has to be on or associated with the product. So, you know if you're putting if you're putting your ABC logo on a mug and you're selling the mug and that's the product that you're selling, then that's that could be a trademark. Um, and you, that's one class. And if you're also selling T-shirts, that's a different class than mugs. So it, it's just a definition that the trademark came up with. You're not going to know what the classes are until you try to register it or if, or if you t talk to an attorney. And if you offer a service, then like a product. Right, services can be, will be different classes as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I have a situation where I have a friend, uh, she owns a business and she has her trademark put on bunch of different products like clothing and bags already and I was wondering so she didn't create the, the artwork so does the artist can the artist go back and say you know file an application and all right what should she yeah. do that so the so the question is um, you know if the artists own, own any rights in the trademark and the answer is the same as with the patents I mean if you're having someone design a logo for you make sure your agreement with them says that they're going to sign their rights to you. Because if not, there's a possibility that they can do that. And maybe if, if it's a logo, it could be copyright issues as well. So you want to make sure <laughs> they assign all rights, whether it's copyright, trademark, patents, to you. Is there another question? Yes. Okay. Um, if you're selling, for example, say you have a tea company, and your logo is only on the packaging, not on the tea itself, so would the class you file for actually be the packaging? So the trademark has to be used in a trademark sense. It, it has to be used for the purpose of letting cons consumers know that this is your product. So the use has to be, it ha first off, the, the product has to be sold in commerce, which isn't a, a big deal, but, um, but it has to be on or associated with the product. Most preferably, it should be on the product so that when somebody picks up the Big Mac, it says Big Mac on, on the pack. Well, that's a package, I'm sorry. So if it's on the container that, that encloses it, uh, it should say it on there. But if it's, if it's a product, if you're selling a stair uh, um, an exercise device, you, you put it right on there. But does Burger King have the licensing to basically the paper? Like, is that the, the packaging? The packaging so, itself. So the, the trademark is for the goods. Okay. I mean, they're not selling. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, so they're not selling the packaging, they're selling the goods inside the packaging. So the trademark covers that. So if somebody else is selling a hamburger, um, you know, it, it would be if, if somebody else puts it on their packaging, puts their logo on the packaging, then that, that could be an infringement. Yes? So let's say you, you develop a product, you have a trademark, but 
but then you realize Under Armour would be a better trademark, so you form a licensing agreement with Under Armour. Would you need a patent to form a license agreement or a licensing agreement, or do you not need a patent? So the question is, how, how can you license trademarks from other people? And you can, you can, you know, somebody else owns a trademark, you can license it from them, and there are certain companies that are set up, and they'll, they love to license out their trademarks. Some don't under any sub, uh, circumstances. But you can go to somebody, and just like patent, you can, for patent, you can license anything you want. You could patent, uh, you could license the right to sell it in a certain area of the country, geographically, a certain industry, you can uh, do it for a certain period of time. Same with trademarks, you can, uh, however you think, you know, I just want to be able to uh, sell in, on K Street. You can get a lot, you know, talk to somebody about licensing only that use. So, um, so would you need to get a patent prior to forming a license? No, pa patents and trademarks are really separate. Okay. Uh, just because you have one doesn't mean that you need or can use the other. I mean, if, if you have a pizza store, uh, you may get a trademark for it, but you know, it's just a pizza, so you, you can't get a patent. Yes? Uh, this might be a basic question, but do you, uh, do you want to trademark your company's name as well? As well as the product? So like with a Chevy Nova, do you want to trademark Chevrolet and Nova, or just the combined thing? Yeah, so the question is whether you can tra get a trademark on the company name. Sometimes you can, but it has to be, if you're using that, in association with the actual product that you're selling. So oftentimes you will see that a car not only says Chevrolet, you know, not only says uh, we just bought a Jeep Latitude, so not only says Latitude, but it says Jeep. So, um, so you would have two trademarks in that instance. The, the test for trademarks is whether it's likely to cause confusion in the marketplace. So, you know, somebody's going down and they and they want to buy a hamburger, and they see the name of your company is confusingly similar with uh, the name of another company, then the trademark office isn't going to give you that uh, trademark. So you can't just, you know, if it sounds the same, if it's spelled the same or similar, uh, if it's pronounced the same, whatever it is, uh, if it's too similar to to what el what someone else is doing, then then you're going to and and it's in the same uh, type of classification, the same type of goods. So if you both selling the same type of product or service, then you're, you're going to have a problem. Uh, copyrights, again, it uh, goes to just putting something in writing. Copyrights actually vest automatically, but you can register them with the uh, Library of Congress. And apparently, they have a great helpline over there. There are a number of different forms you may have to use, but they're very helpful. And, and the cost is somewhere less than $50. I think it's $30 to, to file a uh, copyright application. You know, it depends. Is it, is it worth your time to do that? It just depends on what it is you created. Certainly, if it's a song or you know, an artistic, something artistic, a painting or whatever, you may, you may want to do that. Trade secrets, uh, the reason I put this up there is, um, you know, there are types of things like uh, employment agreements and consulting agreements that you should put in there that, you know, whatever trade secrets you learn during the course of, my, course of your work here, uh, you want to have protected. So a trade secret, you have to do something affirmatively to protect it as a trade secret. So it's not enough that it's, you know, it's, a tra it's uh, valuable information like a customer list, pricing information, or whatever it is, your way of doing business. But you have, to, you have to say, you have to tell the employee, first you have to restrict what employees have access to the information. You have to protect it somehow. And then you have to remind the employee that this is confidential information. You shouldn't be disclosing it. And also, you should think about, hey, you know, I worked at a pizza place, and I'm going to start my own pizza chain and do exactly what they did. Uh, even if they don't have a patent, there may be trade secrets in there that you have to worry about. Can you do that? So uh, you do want to use your experience from prior jobs and, and the like, but you need to be careful and cognizant of what, what might be considered a trade secret so that you don't get uh, yourself in trouble. I just put in a couple of links here. Um, does anyone have any final questions? Yes? Going back to the uh, copyright of uh, music and art, for instance. Uh, so if I reproduce 
If you reproduce it yourself? Like if I paint it myself by looking at somebody else's. Oh, so um, I'm sorry. So copyright protects you from others copying your idea. So you cannot, you know, copy like that. You can't copy and paste it. You can't, um, you know, um, reproduce it by by looking at the original work and coming up with your own. Um, that that would be a problem. The expression, I guess, is defined in a particular way. Then? When they say protects the expression and not the underlying idea. So, um, so it, it protects. So, so it, it, there's a test of whether whether or not it it's something that you co copied um, in order to come up with your work, whatever it happens to be, so your painting or, or whatever. So you can't make something that um, is derived from the original item that's copyrighted. So that's very much unlike patents. So patents, uh, it doesn't matter if you copy it, copy, copy it or if you didn't know about the prior patent at all. If you build a bucket with a handle on it um, and you never knew about the other guy who made the bucket before you, you're, you could still infringe that original patent even though you had no idea about it. So for copyrights, you would have to look at the bucket. I mean, you, you wouldn't copyright a, a bucket, but... Um, you would have to see the bucket and, and physically or somehow copy what, what was done before. Anyone else? Yes? Um, so you, I'm not quite sure. I think my question goes between copyrights and trade secrets. Oh, I'm sorry. We, 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 we don't do those. The situation is that I want to take my dissertation research, which I'm going to have to present at conferences and publish and then put, upload on now in the dissertation center. I'm going to have to do all of that in order to get my degree. When I'm finished, I want to broaden my problem and then turn it into a business. So I'm curious about copyright and then later the trade secret issue. Would be. Okay. Um, just full disclosure, I represent GW, so. <laughs> so um, but, but if you, if, first off, the reason I mention that is because, you know, if you develop, so the question is if I develop something at a job or and then I go on and I develop more information later. Um, there, there is a possibility that some of the rights to the original work will be owned by your original company and it depends on what the agreement says. For instance, GW has a patent policy or you have an employment agreement that you've signed. You need to look back at the document and see exactly what does it ask you to sign to that original company that you worked at. <clears throat> and if you come up with improvements later, I mean, like I said, everybody comes up with improvements later, right? That's, that's what it's all about, is continuing to innovate. If you come up with improvements later, you got to, it's, it's a contractual issue as to what exactly um, is owned by the company that you started working for. But won't her, won't her dissertation, might her dissertation necessarily force her to reveal trade secrets? Is that, is that your question? We, we can talk afterwards. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone has questions, I'll hang around for a few minutes, but I think we're probably going to get kicked out. Yeah.